this also has your bigger ideas, but it, it's appropriate for a science fiction book to hold such. Uh, we talked about some of the Stalinisms that are in here, but it also contains ideas that uh, inside of themselves probably can't be explored by a human properly unless we're able to transcend ourselves and maybe escape form in some ways, uh, such as the idea of nothingness or deep time or even the cosmos, but the unknown in general. Uh, but you are able to sort of show the flaws within the system itself or within the characters by using some of these deep, deeper ideas. Well, and sometimes, say, a concept like nothingness will give way to a memory of Valjean, and he'll be, in a way, speaking through you, it reminded me of sort of some of Jessica's books, too, the way that you construct some of the framing of these scenes, in that it does become ambiguous as to whether the narrator is the same narrator all the way through, or whether it's the author imposing his will on the narrator to get out these ideas. Yeah, and another thing, too... Uh one of the big ideas is what is reality. Um, we we get we get some pseudo history as well as real history because we find out early on from Mel John, who's a student of of human history, that when human beings first left uh, on these long missions before smack speed was recovered, they had these multi generation ships, uh, and on the first trip outside of the solar system. Apparently, natural humans lost the ability to dream. But we later find out that that's not so. So there's some kind of cultural hoodoo going on there. Is it the goo uh, trying to redact its own history? We find out that there are some, uh, like I said, uh, some ties with criminal organizations that, uh, that uh, the goo has sometimes outsourced the suppression of protest movements by using some of these criminal organizations. Uh, and and so we we also find out too that this avarice and greed uh, run amok here because uh, now not only is there such a thing as terraforming worlds, but uh, groups of people can pay to terraform worlds. What took hundreds of years to terraform Mars and Venus in our own solar system back in the third millennium, by the fourth millennium, now whole worlds can be terraformed within a matter of of weeks or, or years, we find out, one of my, my favorite parts is when we find out how uh, a cartel has basically quarantined this planet that's filled with these creatures uh, that uh, it's hunting uh, because they can produce some kind of diamonds or, or something, uh, some kind of precious uh, object or whatnot. And so we see that human beings are still avaricious. Uh, and this goes to the idea again that it is a dystopia. And I, I mentioned this uh, earlier, uh, when we've talked, uh, not here, uh, not on, you know, recording, but uh, that th the thing that I think makes this by far the most realistic and realistic as you can be projecting 1500 years out, but the most realistic emotional and psychological dystopia that there is, is that unlike Brave New World, unlike 1984, Animal Farm, which is just a fable, uh, unlike We by Yevgeny Zamayat, and unlike uh, uh, Gulliver's Travels, this is a dystopia that most of the characters don't recognize is a dystopia. Meljean has some vague hints that it, it may be. Most of the characters are satisfied. Unlike Bra I mean, Brave New World, in Brave New World, the characters are sort of narcotized into their utopia. Uh, in Fahrenheit 451, uh, there's a small underground. Uh, in in 1984, there's Big Brother watching everything. But here, the, the, the people live for a long time. They're healthy. They're beautiful. Even the poorest of the poor, you know, are still far beyond what, uh, what uh, uh, you know, we would consider impoverished now in the 21st century. So this is the dystopia that is realistic and more possible because the only way that a dystopia can last and you just have to look at Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union you just have to look at uh, Cuba or any of these any of these uh, despotic regimes and, and empires over the centuries within a few centuries they all tend to collapse under their own weight people get unhappy they overthrow it or they just apathetically move on 
in this this dystopia, everyone is kind of happy, and they don't have to be narcotized by drugs or, or whatnot. Although certainly, I'm sure that's available. But when you have all of your needs being met, who's going to complain? You know, if if you know, 50 light years away, the the goo is suppressing. Uh, elections or is outsourcing that suppression to gangsters who cares if I live on a world that's been terraformed and it's like you know living in uh, Honolulu a year round you know you mentioned uh, dreams early on uh, it has a very dreamlike structure the entirety of the narrative too uh, in that characters will wake up and you'll begin questioning the reality that is around them uh, for a society that's makes you think there is no such thing as dreams, and then it's revealed that they, in fact, do dream in some capacity. Uh, the structure of it is very much like that, where you're beginning to question the events that unfold afterwards. Uh, it sort of reminded me of Andre Tarkovsky on steroids, in a way. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, but I, I also try to ground it, because one of the things, I, I didn't want this book to be just that Tarkovsky... Kubrickian, you know, oh, 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 and one of the ways I do that is how I do it. Uh, I go back basically to the first book of the trilogy, uh, where I had a lot of uh, myths and legends. Here, I have a lot of jokes and a lot of bad jokes. Uh, the character of Meljean is constantly. I wanted to mention that. I wanted to mention that uh, before you get into it. Uh, it it's not distinguished from Tarkovsky or Kubrick in the sense that uh, it's, it's not just a dream or it's not, it doesn't have that, those arias, uh, but also in that it holds down on the smaller moments too. You know, uh, Elias Walker, he has this uh, very enjoyable tendency to mispronounce uh, Killian as Killian yeah. over and over just in, in service to his contempt of having to pronounce it as Killian. Yeah, and, and, then, and he, uh, he clearly uh, knows the correct pronunciation too. He's just doing it. And uh, Francois Mojan, he, he has a tendency not only to go back to the past of his uh, Louisiana, but also to have these terrible jokes uh, that have no, no real punchline to them and are, are kind of Shakespearean in the sense that they go on forever. Uh, and, the, and then, oh my God. But it reminds me of one of my favorite sections of, of this book, which is probably something that we overlooked, but it resonated in a way of uh, Francois and Lisette talking about the ancient sport of baseball. Uh, and as they're speaking about it and how it's like it flows, there's this undercurrent beneath this conversation of the dogfish kind of lurking in the background. Mm -hmm. And you get that in real life too. I know a, a real life example that, that I had recently was where two of uh, my family members were talking about Floyd Mayweather and his merits, but there was also this undercurrent of resentment of the conversations that had nothing to do with the sport themselves. So those realistic conversations and what is really beneath them are, are what heard this through just a bunch of high ideas. And it has moments of humor and just small human interactions that uh, sort of grease the wheels through the narrative. Yeah. Uh, and and just, just so you know, I looked it up. The character, the old man the name was uh, Crossax. And he lived in the bayou, and I'm, I'm, I'm even giving, uh, giving like the, there were these this mythos because apparently one of the things that said is that the Earth had a total meltdown, Antarctica and Greenland collapsed. There was a a, a climate disaster, and so the first world that was really t terraformed was Earth, and then things were eventually restored. Uh, but uh, uh, in this restored in the restored uh, bayous of Louisiana, there were still some old people who hung on, and 